Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurachek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is really, really cool, actually. I had no idea, but... In the end, turns out he is a really, really big pioneer in this field, and uh, we can thank him actually a lot for for a lot of the the breakthroughs in this field a long time ago, two decades ago even. Now he is an adjunct associate professor and consultant. He is he used to be he's semi retired. He used to be at the Georgian Tech, but now he's kind of just doing consulting work. But why he's so special is that he actually was one of the founders or one of the the first people to build a two photon microscope so being able to see proteins and, and protein reactions within within cells is kind of something that we can all thank him for i mean this is something that's very common nowadays but yeah 20 years ago he did a lot of speeches and a lot of talks basically saying that that this is possible you can have really good resolution and be able to see what what the brain is doing, what neurons are doing, how they're growing, how they're learning, in effect. Uh, his main focus was cultured neurons, cultured cells. And in this way, it's kind of a, a sandbox mode of, of being able to look at what neurons are doing and, and how a brain is reacting. So you don't have to go into a, a much, much more complicated rat brain, for example, but you could just go with this with less cells. Now, he also is a big advocate for learning and teaching uh open source i guess is is what i'm trying to say and i think this is amazing like this is this this really struck a chord with me as as you may hear in the episode because i i'm all about this as well this is why i'm doing the podcast i want to share it with as many people as possible share this knowledge what i'm finding out and uh just really these interesting people and he's he's doing a lot of cool stuff with this i'll i'll maybe talk about it more at the end of the the podcast he has neuro writer and uh lots of other open source kind of um, projects and all of his papers are open source as well so you can go on his website and find any of the papers that he's published and, and read it without being behind a paywall so I've really liked it we talked about some really cool experiments some really cool demonstrations like backyard brains where you can have these kits basically for a hundred few hundred dollars and be able to show basically children or anybody the fundamentals of neurons and and how it works and and maybe even control other people's bodies with it. It's just really fun demonstrations. So I thought this was really cool. And actually in the beginning, we were talking about how he's left the field and he's gone into consulting, how he left being a professor. And I was I was a little bit disappointed. I was like, oh man, come on, you need to you need to get back in so you can continue to grow the field. But he said basically, ah, oh, it's too difficult or it was a too big of a, a suck on my time and I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. So uh, this is this is where we start. Anyways, guys, I, I really enjoyed this podcast i think it was a, with uh first of all with a very uh groundbreaking person a leader in this field truly a leader in this field and it was very interesting as well like the nothing but interesting stuff so um hopefully you like it and we'll talk more on the other side you're giving up this um this body of knowledge and your expertise couldn't you kind of have both like have one as a hobby something like that I'm I'm decent at managing. I had a lab of about a dozen people at its biggest, and 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 you know it's, we accomplished a lot. We we published some fantastic papers. They're very well cited. Uh, we've made a lot of open source technology, both hardware and software, and we also shared a lot of our data. So so I feel like we we accomplished. Uh, many things that are still out there. You know, they haven't gone away. These papers are still there. The data is still there. And people are still benefiting from our uh, NeuroWriter suite of software and hardware. But, you know, it was just too much of a slog for me to to do all that and try to be a maker as well. Now, there there were two summers in which I wasn't teaching and I was able to actually come in the lab and rebuild our two-photon microscope. And those were the funnest times I had at Georgia Tech where I got to spend full time in the lab, actually programming and, and doing electronics and optics and building a, a microscope. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, being a group leader or, or, I don't know, somehow a manager, a glorified manager is not is not the position for you. But but I think, yeah, like you said, there, there could be some kind of 
ideal position and from the outside like looking like a program or a graduate student or something like this but maybe that's the ideal for you and and you could just come into that i don't know it's just i i, I think it's kind of a shame like uh, i i think you are good at at this uh this maker movement and i saw i saw the scrabble keyboard or i saw the wooden keyboard but at the same time i think it is kind of a shame to give up you know many decades of, of research and, and acquired knowledge uh because you have you have created stuff but also i think the potential to create stuff is is very big as well yeah well thank you for that um i it was a tough decision you know it certainly is a big part of my life i still love it it's not like i'm leaving it because i don't like it or anything I, I absolutely love the research we did and i absolutely loved being a professor but um, uh, it wasn't really, you know, the, the managing aspect of it and sitting in my office writing wasn't the funnest part of it. And I would rather actually be making stuff with my own hands. Now, to say that I'm giving it up is probably not the right word to use because I'm still a consultant. And, you know, if anybody wants to tap into my knowledge base, they are welcome to do that and to hire me and pay me money to do that. I I don't review papers or grants for free anymore. I, I, I expect to get paid for it because I don't have a regular professor job. But I would like to continue to be part of this community and you know to interact with my fellow scientists and engineers and to hope I hope to continue to push neuroengineering in the directions that we set it going. You know when we started this thing. Interesting. So are you still up to date on on everything and, and attending conferences and all this? Well, I do attend some. I'm definitely not as up to date as I once was. It's very hard to keep track of all the different fields that I was dealing with, even when I was doing it full time. Now that I've um, definitely moved into other areas that are unrelated, I spend a lot less time tracking the literature and, and going to conferences. But I did go to the um, the, the multi-electrode array conference in Germany about a year ago and gave a talk there. And um, I also am keeping track on a lot of sort of new stuff to do with brain interfaces, mostly non-invasive interfaces like EEG and transcranial brain stimulation. So that's kind of a new direction that, you know, my lab didn't actually pursue in a, in a physical way, although we did talk about it and, and um, think about it a lot, but we didn't actually do experiments with these kinds of non-invasive -inter, non interfaces. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about there is the potential for citizen neuroscience, you know, that now lay people can do experimentation that really was only once uh, uh, possible in the ivory tower because the equipment was so expensive. You know, now people can afford to buy a pretty cheap EEG rig and, and do some serious neuroscience research uh, in their maker spaces or in their homes or their basements or wherever in their schools. Um, so citizen neuroscience could be a big thing now. That's really impressive. Uh, what do the citizen neuroscientists need to know in order to get started in this? Yeah, well, I suppose I'm a very, very much a believer in, in learning by doing. And so the thing to do is to get either get some kind of a device that you can record your brain waves or go find somebody who has one and use theirs. Uh, a lot of maker spaces have these things nowadays and, and uh, you could also volunteer to be a subject in some scientists research experiments. You know, if, if uh, they often put out flyers to say, please come and, and be a subject and we'll pay you $20 or whatever. So that's one thing you can do. But, but you can just go buy a, a Say the open BCI rig is only a couple hundred bucks, I think, and uh, you could also get something like Muse, you know, one of these uh, EEG headbands that help you meditate. And there are apps out there that allow you to hack into the raw data from the Muse, so you don't have to use their app. You can use whatever app you want or write your own app and just start playing around with the data and see what you can see and see what what effects you get by putting the electrodes in different parts of your head while you're doing things. You know, and the transcranial brain stimulation thing is also becoming kind of a hacker um, activity now that there are a lot of people that are building their own transcranial stimulators. It's a very cheap, simple thing to build. It's just a matter of, you know, regulating the current so that you don't electrocute yourself. Uh, you, you want to be able to deliver it about 2 milliamps maximum through your skull into your brain. And when people do this, they're finding all sorts of interesting effects to enhance their learning or concentration or gaming abilities or, or what depression is another thing. They're helping uh, fight depression. So there are, there are lots of things, and we're kind of in the, the 
very early days of understanding how this works or even how best to implement it. And I think that the citizen neuroscientists can really help out there by just trying lots of different things and seeing what works. Yeah, I was actually watching one of your talks and you were saying uh, like there would be different settings, you know, for, for studying versus going to like social parties. Like I want level one for this and level four to be social and, and clever and stuff like this. Yeah, well, that was in regard to some implanted electrodes that had been implanted for the purpose of curing some fairly serious problem like Parkinson's or, or a tremor or something like that. So if you have electrodes already implanted and it turns out that they do something beneficial in addition to helping cure whatever disease they're trying to cure, then why not take advantage of that? You know, why not tweak the parameters to optimize not only the curing of the disease, but also the enhancing of whatever personality traits you want to enhance or ability to concentrate or reducing your depression. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. So uh, how did you get into this field, actually? Well, I guess that depends on what you mean by this field. Um, I, I, in grad school, I did mostly biochemistry, and I was in the psychobiology department at UC Irvine, and I was working for Dana Oswald, who was doing uh, brain biochemistry, because I had an undergrad degree from UC San Diego in biochemistry, and he said, wow, you know, it'd be nice to have somebody who knows biochemistry in my lab. You know, and the work that I did there, I, I'm proud of it. Uh, we we studied protein aging and, and this particular protein called calmodulin, which is a very important protein in a lot of different cellular processes in the brain and other tissues. Um, but I really wanted to be a neuroscientist, and I really wanted to do some serious brain electrophysiology research. And um, I didn't really get to do that until I was a postdoc. And when I was thinking about where I wanted to be a postdoc, I said, what kind of a system would I like to work in? And I thought it would be really cool to work in a system where you could watch the learning happen and study learning in a cellular and network way in some sort of a creature where you could actually see the learning process. And I thought about maybe insects or worms or something. But then I thought, how about if you had neurons growing in a dish, in a petri dish, maybe you could watch the learning process there. And so I, I went to Caltech for my postdoc because Jerry Pine was there and he knew that some of the techniques that I knew I would want to learn to, um, to make this possible. So at Caltech, I spent eight years building the tools to study learning in vitro, which means um, that we, we, we founded this new field called embodied cultured networks, where you take a, a network of brain cells that we usually got from rat cortex grow them in a petri dish, and the petri dish is instrumented with electrodes on the substrate, and you make a two-way interface between the brain cells and a computer, and then you can use that signals from the cells to control a robot or a simulated creature we call a neurally controlled animat. So, um, so we built all these tools, uh, including the multi-electrode arrays, and the, we built a, Jerry Pine and I built a high-speed camera for imaging neural activity, and I was also working in the lab of Scott Fraser, and in that lab I built a one of the world's first two-photon microscopes for imaging living tissue. And I, so this was part of the idea of watching the learning while it happens. So if you if you um, if you label tissue with some fluorescent proteins like green fluorescent protein, you can see the neurons lit up under the microscope. And if you use a two-photon microscope. You can image them growing, make time-lapse movies without killing them. And in 1996, when I built that microscope, nobody had done that before. So, so I was the first one to make a three-dimensional time-lapse movie of neurons growing that were labeled with the green fluorescent protein. And that was a big deal back then. You know, Even just to be able to image the green fluorescent protein in three dimensions was a big deal. And now it's kind of routine. Everybody in every biology department has a two-photon microscope and they're all imaging GFP, uh, watching neurons growing. But back in 1996, um, nobody had done this before. So it was very exciting. And I basically get, gave a lot of talks saying, look, you can do this too. You could build a microscope. It's not that hard to convert an old confocal microscope to two-photon and um, make it something that you can use to watch for example, we imaged um, dendritic spines in collaboration with Aaron Schumann. We were putting brain slices on the two-photon microscope that were labeled with 
various different dyes and, and fluorescent proteins, and we could watch the dendritic spines changing as we put on brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And this was kind of revolutionary at the time, but now everybody just says, oh yeah, of course, BDNF changes your dendritic spines. Well, we were the first ones to see that under the microscope. Watch those changes happen. Wow. Uh, I mean, I was learning about this in my master's, so it's, it's really cool. I'm, I'm in awe to be you know, talking to you, uh, the, one of the pioneers of, of uh, this, this whole field. So what was your what was your goals of this? I mean, you, you wanted to see how the the neurons were were growing and linking in order to understand it better, something along these lines. Yeah, to you know to watch learning happen. It had been done a lot, obviously a lot in animals. You know, there's plenty of behavioral researchers out there, and there were a lot of people. I would say you know the majority of the hardcore neuroscientists were studying learning at a molecular level. They were looking at LTP and they wanted to know which proteins were involved in long-term potentiation and and when the synapse changes its strength, which proteins are involved and what gets phosphorylated and all this stuff. It was a very molecular approach and they were doing mutations to you know fruit fly experiments and mutations to figure out what are the molecules involved. But I thought there's this huge gap in the middle there between the molecules and the animals that we really don't know much about, we still don't know much about, which is the networks level. You know, you can say, okay, I understand that a synapse gets stronger when you learn something, but what does that mean? Where is the actual learning happen? Is it at one synapse? Probably not. It's a, it's a, it's a many synapses across a large network of cells, and we didn't really have any tools to study things at the networks level in any great detail. You know, you could study them with functional MRI, with a voxel size of a few millimeters. And one, one cubic millimeter of brain tissue has hundreds of thousands of cells in it. So, so we're talking a gross analysis at the network level was possible. But with something like two-photon microscopes and microelectrodes, you can study it at the single cell level across networks. And especially if you have it growing in a petri dish where you can look at every single cell in the network. You've got them all right there under the microscope. And if you connect them up to an animat or a robot, you can have a behaving animal that, whose body is moved away from its brain so that the brain holds still while it's learning. This is not true for any animals. You know, animals tend to move while they're learning, and it's, hard, it's very difficult to image their brains during the learning process uh, because of that movement, you know, if you want to look at things at the microscopic level. Now, that said, there are a few fantastic experiments that have been done now with people who either fix the animal's heads in, in a in some kind of a vice that holds it very steady while they're running on, uh, say, a, a styrofoam ball, or they made a microscope that's tiny enough for the animal to carry around on their head while they run around in a maze or something. So there are other approaches that are of a similar goal as mine of watching the learning happen. But at the time I started this, those guys uh, hadn't done that yet. And I said, well, the only way we could possibly see a learning happen is if the brain is holding perfectly still on the microscope stage. And actually, I mean, even in those, even in those cases, I mean, there is some kind of, there is some vibrations from the body and blood pressure and everything like this. So you, you get a good amount of movement, actually. Right. And they've done a fantastic job of, of trying to reduce all those artifacts either with computational approaches or just sort of synchronizing them with the heartbeat or various clever tricks like that have now gotten to the level where they can see individual spines changing while the animals are learning. Um, but, but I think the in vitro approach still has merit. It's still much easier than doing that in animals. Um, and I think probably the mo more importantly, it's a much simpler system, you know, than a living, an intact living animal is just an immensely complicated beast, even if it's an insect. Um, if we're talking about 100,000 neurons in a petri dish, you have the advantage that they're mammalian neurons, you know, they really did come from a mammal, so the brain cells are like the ones in humans. Um, however, it's a much simpler network and presumably might be bit easier to understand what it's doing. Uh, more than in an intact animal, you know, that that raises the question, is it doing anything relevant now that you've taken that out of the animal? And I think by giving it a body, you've given it some relevance. You've given it a job to do. Instead of just sitting there thinking it to itself, it's now controlling a body. It's getting sensory feedback from our uh, closed-loop system that we built. And um, it's behaving and learning and changing and doing all sorts of interesting things. 
Now, I was hoping that by building a, a learning a system for studying learning that we might learn enough about how learning works to make people smarter. You asked about my original goals, and, and that still is my original goal, uh, still is my goal to that neuroscience research might somehow shed light on the learning process well enough to make us a little bit smarter, a little bit more considerate, and make the world a happier place that way. This this 100,000 uh, neurons, okay, so I'm looking this up on Wikipedia right now, so I'm not actually this smart, but that's like a larval zebrafish or a lobster. I don't know, rat, 200 million. So so yeah, I mean, like the, the difference between a rat and, and what you have in this is, is like, I guess, I guess taking apart like a a simple lawnmower engine and uh, versus a you know very complicated I don't know diesel motor or something like this in a, in a Mercedes so and but a hundred times more or something like this so it's much much simpler to to look at and to kind of uncover what what's really going on right yeah and also the fact that it's sort of mostly two dimensional you know it's not quite a perfect monolayer but it's it's only about three cells thick uh, makes it a lot easier to image and to study. Uh, and to probe than a three-dimensional brain structure. Yeah, and you, you had some pretty cool demonstrations with this, actually. You were able to have uh, a, like a robot draw shapes and everything like this from from this this brain and, and even to have it send it over the internet. So so it was disembodied, so to say. Yeah, we had, um, you know, there was an art-science collaboration that we did with uh, Guy Benari and Phil Gamblin in Symbiotica in, uh, in Perth, Australia, they built the robot that drew pictures on big sheets of paper, and they said, "Do you think we could control it with our um, with our culture dishes?" And I said, "Yeah, I think I definitely think we could do that." And we did that. We built a system. This was 2002. The project was called Mayart, and then a, another version of it that they built uh, was called Silent Barrage. And this thing was immensely successful, um, going around to different art galleries all over the world, where we had the brain sitting in our lab. Uh, controlling robots somewhere far, far away, and in some sense, the internet was part of its nervous system, and two-way communication going back and forth. So, for example, in the Silent Barrage exhibit, um, when people walked through the exhibit, video cameras recorded their position, and that was used to stimulate the neurons in the dish in our lab, and then the neurons would respond, and the responses would get sent to the robots to control their movements. That's really cool. So what were some of the challenges in, in this research of the, the cultured neurons? Well, certainly uh, just keeping cultured neurons is alive. Keeping them alive is a big challenge. Uh, they must be kept sterile because they, when, as soon as you take them out of the brain, they no longer have an immune system. So if a single germ gets in there, they're dead. And we developed a system for keeping them alive longer than anyone else had done for neural cultures. I think our oldest culture lived to be two years old, and, and my postdoc, Tom DeMars, was the one who take, took care of them for those two years. And he, he did lots of experiments on one culture that, that we called the Methuselah culture because it had lived so long. And this, the, the, the idea was not very complicated. I just built these lids for the culture dishes that were porous that allowed gases to go through the, the Teflon membrane and that would keep the cells happy, but it also kept the germs out. And uh, it also reduced evaporation. Sometimes when the culture medium evaporates, the cells get very unhappy. So it was kind of a way to just maintain the environment of the cells in a happy um, environment. And this method for keeping cultured neurons alive for a long time is now used all over the place. And that paper in which we published that technique is, is I think, probably our most cited paper. So, so that was one of the big um, challenges was just, you know, long-term uh, survival of these cultures so that we could do some long experiments with them. Another one uh, was making the closed loop system. So we wanted to be able to take signals that we recorded from the brain cells in the dish and to process them very quickly and use the results to stimulate the cultures. So in, you could think of this in, in the embodied system as a sensory motor feedback loop. So the recordings that we're getting out of the dish are used to move the robot around or the simulated animal. They, they are the motor commands. They're moving this thing around. And then that, the animat or the robot has a sensory system, some kind of sensors like, like uh, ultrasonic rangefinders or wheel encoders. And those, 
sensory uh, devices get translated by our electronics into electrical stimuli that we delivered back to the culture dish. So to build this closed loop system that's fast enough, and we're talking about 10 milliseconds to go around the loop here, uh, it took quite a bit of technology and engineering to do that. And that was done uh, at first by Tom DeMars and then by my graduate student, Daniel Vachanar. They built these fantastic multi-electrode stimulators that are being used by lots of other people because we made it all open source and shared the plans for these things. Another another way that you're a pioneer. This is really this is really amazing that this field has to, uh, you know, might even be named after you slowly. <laughs> well, I don't really care as much about that as that more people use it. You know, I wish that um, it didn't really catch on in America for some reason. Uh, I think mostly because the funding agencies were skeptical that, you know, they're not, they're pretty conservative. The NIH especially is very conservative in terms of the kinds of neuroscience that they would like to fund. And it was the Italians that really picked up on this. There's some very good Italian research that uses these neurally controlled animats or, or embodied cultured systems. I'm thinking of uh, Michaela Ciappelloni and Sergio Martinoia especially. And then also a few Japanese groups, Suguru Kudo is one um, that's doing this. And, you know, a few scattered ones, Shimon Marom in Israel has also picked up on this and done some fantastic work. So a few groups have said, you know, yeah, the in vitro closed loop systems could be a useful mechanism for studying all sorts of neural dynamics where you have a tractable system that's simple enough that you could conceivably look at the whole network and map it out or even make it well-defined. Bruce Wheeler is one of the few people in America that really has been pushing this for some time to, to create a network of a certain architecture in vitro so that it might carry out certain types of computations or something. Um, and, and by making all of our tools open source and all of our um, code available and also by... Um, sharing a lot of our data. We, put, we posted a lot of our data online for other people to look at and to analyze. Um, we are encouraging people to pick up on this idea and to uh, and try it out themselves. That's, that's amazing. That's actually, I guess that's the future of research and, and uh, this kind of frictionless collaboration, not having to wait for uh, a scientific paper to come out, which is, you know, as you know, a many month long process and, and have them being able to pick up on it within days. Yeah, a lot of times, um, you know, you, they put even if you're trying to publish something, they actually force you to put an embargo on things, so so that if you have released it, uh, certain journals will say no, we won't publish that. You know, we only want to publish something that is brand new that nobody's ever heard of before, and so we just avoided those journals. <laughs> we we mostly published in open journals where you can download the papers freely, and if they're not open journals, we put the papers up on our website. Since 1995, you know, I, I created the website for the Pine Lab uh, when I was a postdoc there and put all of our papers up there since 1995 for free downloading. That's uh, been an annoying thing for me, you know, especially having been in academia, having done done my master's and then now out of it. I, I'm like, oh, man, I really didn't, I guess, take advantage of it enough, like this free access to research papers. And so I'm really grateful to you, actually, before before this call, I, I downloaded a, a good amount uh, from yours. And, and uh, also there's there's one uh, Frontiers of Science, you know, previous guest for uh, Mikhail Lebedev. And he's like, yeah, all 160 papers on there are for free. So I was like, thank you. You. Finally, I can start reading something and and uh, actually learning more uh, than than I used to. So it, it's really it's really aggravating. It's, I think it has to end this this uh, paywalls. Yeah, it is changing, and uh, there are you know, for example, any research that's funded by the National Institutes of Health in America has to be open. They they have a rule there that once you publish a paper, you have to make it freely available. And so they kind of got around the publishers paywalls by saying. Well, what we'll do is we'll create our own HTML version of your paper, and that HTML version is the one that people can download freely. So it's may, maybe not the exact same as the paper that um, that you publish, but it contains pretty much all the same information, maybe in a different formatting. And I really appreciate the fact that the NIH made a rule like that. Definitely, yeah. So I, I really like these uh, this idea of the culture neurons. I think it's I think it's really really cool. Like um, kind of a a sandbox in, in which to play with it and learn a little bit more about the brain. What do you think the future breakthroughs will be in this field? Well, um, as I mentioned, the funding 
you know, was always an issue, especially in America. And some exciting things are happening. It seems to me that some big organizations outside of academia are taking this on as a challenge, the whole neural interfacing idea. And I'm especially excited about Neuralink, you know, mostly because I just am such an admirer of Elon Musk. Every single thing that he tries to do, he seems to succeed way beyond everybody's expectations. You know, he got behind electric cars. They're now the way best electric car on the planet by far. Um, he got behind solar power. He's pretty soon going to be putting solar tiles on everybody's roofs. He got behind rockets, and they're the best, cheapest rockets that you can use to get to the space station right now. So if he puts his money and his uh, energy behind Neuralink, this company that's going to do neural interfaces, I'm I'm assuming and hoping that it will accelerate the same way his rockets are, you know, that this thing is just going to take off and it'll just be way better than the kind of academic research where we're just making progress by tiny little increments. Every time we get one small grant, we can do a little bit more progress. If you have a big expensive, uh, big, rich company with lots of wheelbase, then maybe the neural interfacing field will really take off. And I'm hoping that he and others will start to appreciate that you sort of need this sandbox approach. You know, you need some simpler system to to start with if you're going to do neural interfacing. A lot of the interface research that we did is applicable to living systems. So, for example, the last thing that we um, did research on before I closed my lab at Georgia Tech, was to do a closed-loop optogenetic system. So half of the loop was optical, with fiber optics going either into culture dishes or into living rats. And, um, and we used that to, to stimulate the neurons, either to make them fire more or to reduce their firing. And then we used electrodes to record the neurons, and we made a fast closed loop to study uh, sort of slow learning called homeostatic plasticity. And this, this is a really useful system that could help with certain kind of, kinds of diseases like chronic pain, epilepsy, tinnitus. All of these things are problems in homeostatic plasticity. And you could say, oh, let's study this in animals or let's study it in people. But to study it in vitro first is, is a very good first step because you have so much more control over all the variables. So we built this closed-loop optogenetic system. It's called NeuroWriter. And... Um, John Newman was the graduate student of mine who did most of the work designing and building that. Um, John Ralston, before him, made the first version of NeuroWriter. And NeuroWriter is freely available. Anyone can download the software and the plans for the electronics and solder it together themselves and start doing their own closed-loop research if they want to for pretty cheap. You know, we're talking about $5,000 compared to a, a commercial rig that you might buy, which is probably $100,000. So we're trying to open it up to more researchers that don't have so much resources. Uh, but if a big company like Neuralink wants to take it on, they can just get get right into it because of the available systems that we put out there, like NeuroWriter. What would be what would be the the thing that's stopping it for getting getting another 10x drop in price? So down from five thousand to maybe five hundred or fifty dollars. Yeah, I think that there really isn't anything stopping it. So an example that that's already happening is backyard brains. You can buy for $100, you can buy a, a rig for recording neural signals from cockroaches or um, from your own body using, they have a thing called the human-controlled human experiment where you, you hook up electrodes to your arm and, and your muscle signals get recorded, amplified, and used to stimulate another person's muscles and make their arm move. And this is fantastic. Any hacker or even just a hobbyist can do this with the hundred dollar backyard brains kit. So there's no there's no way to, there's no reason why we can't uh, do this very cheaply now. And um, our the system that we designed for this optogenetic stuff probably the limiting factor there is the the genetic constructs are fairly difficult to make. Um, but they're being distributed freely by Carl Dyseroth and Ed Boyden. These guys who really got out to put out the genetics on the map have been very good at sharing all the constructs that they built. And you, you get a little test tube with some viruses in it, and the viruses infect the neurons and make them light sensitive. And then you just get out your fiber optics and start experimenting with them. 
so it's it's fairly cheap to do. It's just technically you know, there's a lot of technical difficulties, you know, taking care of the neurons and and getting all this uh, fiber optics and LED stuff working properly. Uh, hopefully, not just our rig, but other people will will make devices that are more reliable and easier to use and and more plug and play rather than for you know serious experimentalists who are good at electronics to do. Wow, this is really cool. I'm looking at this backyard brains. This is going to be this is amazing. I think this would be great for demonstrations and and uh, teaching kids how to do this as well. Um, but this is really cool. Like especially if you can get a lot more uh, brains behind it and get a lot more I don't know uh, interested people and have it be easy. Like have the barrier to entry be be lower. I think that's when you really get um, a revolution. I think that's when computers and software, for example, really exploded. When when you didn't have to go to the university mainframe, uh, but you could actually like program at home and, and get your own stuff done. And now with apps and everything like this, you could, it's just a click away. That's a fantastic analogy. I think you are you really put your finger on. Where we're at now with this uh, citizen neuroscience, we are exactly right at the point where the personal computer came onto the scene. And I, I was I was there. I wasn't much of a hacker, but I was um, I was right there in the computer lab in high school with my friend who had an Apple IIe, one of the first Apple IIe computers, and and we were sitting there making computer games on it, you know, and and, and he was. He was the one who knew how to program, and I was kind of coming up with the ideas for what he would, what he would program, and we made a great team doing that. And it was incredibly empowering, as you say, um, that we suddenly, you know, instead of having to deal with some big mainframe computer, we could just do this in our own spare time in, in his house, hacking away there. So this is now something that people can do with brain cells. They can go out collect a cockroach or they're a worm or whatever their favorite creature they want to study or study their own muscle signals or their own EEG signals and start to do some interesting experiments. This is really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to do uh, lots of lots of teaching, I guess, you know, to to children, you know, basically 10 year olds. I think if you can't explain this stuff to a 10 year old, then you don't understand it yourself. And I think this is this is the greatest way to do it. This is really cool. I'm, I'm really excited. This is this is why I do the podcast. <laughs> I'm glad that <clears throat> I'm glad you you share my enthusiasm. I one of the things that I did when when uh, I was on my maker sabbatical, we toured all around Ireland and um, visited all the maker spaces. And at one of them called Forma Labs in Cork City, um, it's a bio maker space. And I gave a, a demonstration there where I brought my backyard brains stuff and hooked people up and showed them their brain waves and their heart signals and muscle signals and and I basically couldn't get them to go away. You know, this was supposed to be a 45-minute presentation workshop thing, and it was standing room only in Forma Labs, and the people just kept saying, "Try that, try that." You know, and and after an hour and a half, I was exhausted, and they all they I said, you know, I think I think uh, we've done enough demonstrations. <laughs> Maybe we should call it a day now. <laughs> so there's obviously a desire out there, especially in kids to do this kind of stuff. You know, it's very exciting. And if they hear that it helps them do their gaming, you know, if it makes them better gamers, they get very excited about it. Um, so, so, uh, I don't think it's hard for kids to understand the excitement of it and, uh, to explain to them what's going on in the nervous system. I hate to say it, but even to my college students, we don't understand, you know, when I'm explaining it to college students, there's so much about the brain that we don't understand and the nervous system that we pretty much just have to say, look, what rudimentary understanding we have now is enough to do some pretty cool things. And we can solve certain diseases and we can improve certain conditions and we can perhaps enhance the brain with our rudimentary understanding. Imagine how much further we could go if we understood even more. Wow, yeah, definitely. And empower them, you know, basically give the give the ability the to 15 year old of, of what a professor could do even five years ago something like this yeah definitely citizen neuroscience wow. i love it i love it <laughs> this is probably my my takeaway from this and um yeah this is this is really interesting uh so i'm i'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious. What do you think is maybe wrong with this field? Like, like what is a big mistake or wrong direction that some researchers may be going down in this field? You know, I don't want to disrespect people doing this research because I think some some really good research has been done, uh, patterning neurons on culture dishes, uh, figuring out what kind of substrate cells like to stick to or don't like to stick to, 
Um, but I, th- I feel like it's too early for us to design a specific architecture in a dish um, that we don't really understand enough about how the structure of a network affects its function to say, here's a structure that we should choose. So our approach in my lab was always to let the cells randomly connect the way they want to connect. We never did try to impose any specific architecture on them. You know, that's that's a, really a minor complaint. I, I As I say, some important research has been done to try to make defined networks, and usually when you do that, you find that it's really, really hard. The networks will connect the way they want to connect, not the way you want them to connect. And um, that's a, there's an important lesson right there. So, you know, I suppose the other main thing, which is a soapbox that I've gotten on many, many times, is that closing the loop is really important. If you just poke an electrode into a neuron and record from it, you are only getting half of the story there. You know, and there are a lot of neuroscientists who do that, who who only either stimulate, they only just send sensory input into some animal and they look at their neural signals, or they look at some motor output, and they don't let the animal do this full loop uh, where it's, receiving sensory input, making a decision, and then acting on it by behaving in a certain way. So I really think it's important to get some kind of a closed-loop system. And to do this in vitro uh, is technically difficult, but we did it. We made the tools. They're now available to anyone who wants to do this and make a closed-loop system where you can have not only inputs but outputs interacting with each other. And... um, I think when you do that, you'll have a much more natural neural circuit instead of this, uh, you know, sort of, I guess the way I think of it is a lot of culture dishes with brain cells in them are in sensory deprivation. They're just sitting in the incubator, not getting any inputs. And if you think about an animal or a person in sensory deprivation, their brain is not working properly. It goes crazy pretty quickly. And uh, you start to hallucinate and all sorts of strange things happen because the nervous system evolved to get sensory input. You know, it's always expecting sensory input. And if you don't have that, you have an aberrant, strange, misfunctioning nervous system, dysfunctional nervous system. So, so I think it's really, really important if anybody wants to study the nervous system, whether in animals, in vitro, or in people, that they make it a closed-loop study where you have... You have sensory input and behavioral output all in the system there. With the cultured cells, with the cultured neurons, how do you change the structures of the neurons? Do you do it with proteins or do you do it with the actual geometry of the electrodes that that is like the base of of the the Petri dish? Yeah, so I talked about a couple of different kinds of structural changes. I suppose most recently I was referring to people who were trying to impose a certain structure on the network, and that's not very easy, but the The most common way of doing that is to make a surface that the cells will stick to in a certain shape. Uh, So you pattern a certain uh, kind of molecules that that are adhesive to the cells, like, for example, polyethylene amine is one that we used. And you could pattern that using masks and, and the kinds of techniques that they use to make microchips and create a substrate that where the net where the cells that land on that substrate will stick to it and if they land somewhere else they won't stick and they'll die off or they'll move over to where it's sticky so that's one kind of structure that i was talking about i was also talking about the kinds of structural changes that we observed during the learning process which are the ones that the neurons do themselves you know if you watch any of these time-lapse movies of neurons growing they are incredibly dynamic creatures if you watch them under the microscope with your bare eyes, they're moving kind of slowly like the minute hand on a clock, so you don't notice a whole lot. But if you speed it up about a factor of 10, their movements are very dynamic, and they're constantly reaching out and forming new connections and breaking connections, and they're doing that with, you know, the, the neuron has a sort of a muscular system inside of it, which is based on the protein called actin, and actin is one of the proteins it's in all muscles um, but but believe it or not all the dendrites and axons of a neuron and all of its dendritic spines have this actin protein and other proteins that interact with the actin filaments to move the um, pieces of the neuron and allow them to reach out and grab onto each other and form new synapses and, and uh, get branchier and become much longer you know they can 
the axons can follow a scent trail. They're smelling their way along until they make a connection to the right target neuron or, or muscle cell or some other structure in your brain or in the rest of your body, perhaps. So there's structural changes are just an inherent uh, part of the life of neurons. They don't hold still for very long. They're constantly changing their own structure. I, I guess it would be difficult to, to change the... Uh, to change the structure of it in, in such a system. Um, and I, I, I seem to recall that the actin filaments also depend on the stiffness of the, the neighboring materials as well. And, and depending on the stiffness of the neighboring material, um, they, they change and they, I don't know, they, I guess, determine what the cell will do as well. Oh, yeah, very much so. The, um, the physical substrate that they're growing on uh, not just, you know, I was talking before about the chemical nature of the substrate they're growing on, determining what shape they are and, and whether they adhere or not. But, but just the physical nature of it determines how they grow. And I, I suspect that's because the neurons tend to follow certain structures in the brain to get to their targets. And, for example, during development, embryonic development of the brain, there are these glial cells that go from the middle of the brain out to the surface called radial glia, and the neurons just use them as guideposts. They, they, they grab onto the radial glia and they just follow them up to the, where they need to go in the cortex. So it's a physical structure that they uh, follow, and if you grow them in a dish with lots of grooves cut in it, they will tend to follow the grooves. And so some researchers just pattern neurons just by solely by physical structure. And the neurons are very sensitive to these small features on the order of a few microns size. Um, their little growth cones as they're growing along are sensing these structures and making little decisions about where to grow and where to connect based on the the structure of the environment they happen to find themselves in. It's maybe like a, a grapevine following twine or something like this. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. The radial glia are just like the twines in a, a garden. So do you have any recommendations uh, on who we should talk to or what we should read? You, you already mentioned some names, but um, maybe some other people that, that you find interesting? Well, certainly, um, you know, since your focus is on neural implants... Some of the pioneers of neural implant research, um, maybe you've already interviewed these folks, but um, for example, Dick Norman, who invented the Utah Array, is one of my heroes. He you know, really made some fantastic research there. Ken Wise is the Michigan probe guy. Um, John Donahue and Andy Schwartz have done some fantastic work in, in monkeys and in people. So, But if you're talking about in vitro research, uh, my postdoctoral mentor Jerry Pine is still alive and kicking. I met him uh, about a year ago, and, and although he's getting pretty old, he's still fully with it and would be worth talking to about the history of multi-electrode arrays and culture dishes with neurons growing in them because he's, he really got that going in the 70s. There's another guy named Gunter Gross who did it simultaneously, uh, independently of him, who would be worth talking to. Uh, he was at the um, University of North Texas in Denton. Let's see, who else? Oh, so I was going to say that there are people that are kind of on the cutting edge of this neural implant research at the Allen Brain Institute. Have you talked to any of them? No, I don't think so. Yeah, so definitely look up. I'm not sure who exactly it is there that's doing that these days, but... Um, but uh, the Allen Brain Institute really has uh, made some fantastic accomplishments, and they're always sharing everything they do with the public. So I just love their philosophy, and their goal is to sort of understand the higher brain functions like consciousness by studying model systems like mice, you know, and put them in um, very well-controlled environments and with lots of electrodes poking into their heads and microscopes watching their brains and stuff. So definitely check out the Allen Brain Institute. You know, in terms of the philosophical mentors that I like to read and, and to think about, Kevin Kelly is my favorite right now. Have you, um, have you read this book, in The Inevitables? Uh, that's a new one. No, I don't think I have. Yeah, so The Inevitable is, is uh, where he's proposing pretty much what's going to happen in the next 50 years or so with with everything. You know, he, he really covers everything. He, t he does talk a lot about artificial intelligence and um, he talks a little bit about the brain interface stuff, but that's uh, not, not his focus. He's, 
He's much more about computers and the internet and what's the future of society given that technology is changing so fast. And Kevin Kelly, he was the editor of Wired Magazine and, and he's written some fantastic books before this. Um, so he's really got a lot of credibility. When he makes a prediction, it usually comes true. So, you know, he's not a, he's not a crank. He's not somebody who's just guessing. He really has a lot of facts to base everything that he says and I think the inevitable is um, is just an enjoyable read for anybody who cares about the future of technology. He's got one before that that's called "What Technology Wants," which kind of treats technology as a life form. And and if it is a life form, well, where is it going? And does it care about humans? You know, well, are we part of its master plan? <laughs> so. Um, so there's some interesting philosophy to think about there that he's got gotten me and other people thinking about by writing these books. Yeah, I've, I've read that one, What Technology Wants, and I, I would also highly recommend it, like basically saying that technology is its own thing, almost like a ant colony or something like this, or, or like a termite house, and it's really just using us to build itself, something like yeah. this. So Kevin Kelly is my favorite thinker right now, and uh, anybody who listens to your podcast would probably find his writing accessible and interesting. Many listeners are just starting out in this field. So what recommendations do you have uh, for them to get into the field of either cultured neurons or neural implants or brain machine interfaces? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, I say, you know, to anybody who expresses even a little bit of interest in this, obviously the first thing is to go read scientific papers about it. And as I mentioned, all of our papers are freely downloadable from our website. If you go to potterlab.gaptech.edu and to the publications page, you can read all our papers. You can get to most papers by searching for things on Google Scholar. There'll be some version of it that you can download usually. But but I think, you know, I, as I mentioned before, I'm a, vi- a big believer in learning by doing. And if you have a chance to get into a lab and actually do some research, you should do that. It doesn't matter if you're a high school student or a college student or even somebody who's who's you know, already past college age, you want to just be a non-traditional researcher of some sort, volunteer to work in somebody's research lab and spend some time there getting your hands dirty, growing neurons and collecting data from them and trying to crunch the data and figure out what the hell it means. I think you will learn so much more and more quickly than by studying a lot of books and reading a lot of papers. Um, Obviously, doing what you're doing, talking to people who are already in the field uh, is a very good way to learn this thing. You know, so just find, you know, start by reading the papers and say, ah, this person has written several interesting papers and ask those people questions based on their papers. And I guarantee you any scientist or researcher who gets a question about their papers will answer it. Doesn't matter who you are. Oh, no. I'm going through this audio right now, and it turns out that the last, I don't know, 10 minutes or something like this of Steve Potter's audio was was cut off. So, no! But anyways, uh, based on my questions, because my, my audio was still there, we talked about how you should just kind of push yourself into an internship and push yourself into a, a lab for a minimum of a few months, because that's when you become the most useful. And then... Finally, if you don't know something, you should remedy that with reading lots of journals. Read, read, read. And I talk about a story or my experience with this of how I was kind of bad in my master's thesis, but then it was only when I started reading and read like 40, 50 papers that I started to figure out what the the field was like and yeah, was able to be helpful again. So don't worry if you're not helpful for the first few months. You will be eventually, and this is how you're going to get into the field. Anyways, guys, again, sorry about this, but technology, what can you do? What can you do? There's something weird. I remember there was something weird about the recording, and um, yeah, hopefully you enjoy this, and and you can reach out to Steve Potter on his website or LinkedIn or just generally the same ways you would find any guests on this show. Just type Steve Potter neuro into Google and bing, bang, boom, you got it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really interesting. Like I, I think it's kind of a shame that he's, he's gone down this road of, of basically not being a professor, not being so heavily involved in the field anymore. And I think 
he's a very smart guy. He's a he's a builder. He's a creator. You know, so it needs to continue. I think, but but he wasn't very happy. So it's it's just kind of a shame that that he's not able to. Um, be helping out in this field as he used to be so hopefully like me you enjoyed this episode and found it very informative again you know when we got onto this uh field or this topic of basically open source and teaching children and all this kind of stuff i really resonated with this i really enjoyed it this is this is absolutely the future and being able to explain these things simply is very very important that's that's the point that's the goal of this podcast uh let me know if i'm actually doing it so hopefully you enjoy this i i really like this interview i think this is what the interview should be like this is a little bit uh philosophical side you know keeping stuff open source but also talking about the the nuts and bolts of this so hopefully you've enjoyed this please let me know what you think about this uh please write to me neural implant podcast at gmail.com i i love getting your guys's response your feedback and honestly i can make the show better and if you give me feedback as well of of who i should have on the show uh that's that's another great thing but i just love just generally getting feedback from you and and learning about you as well and, and we can start a conversation i really like this i really appreciate it and it's it's starting finally you know it's it's finally um i'm getting i'm getting more and more feedback so it's it's great this the show is here to stay this show uh was launched just a few months ago but i love it and i'm learning so much and the feedback from you is great so i'm gonna continue because i'm learning as much as you are so until next week this is the neural implant podcast Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.